Hello and welcome to Decision NYC with Ben Max. I'm Ben Max, your host and the executive editor of Gotham Gazette. The 2021 New York City election cycle is well underway and it's poised to be one of the most significant municipal elections in decades. All of city government is on the ballot and because so few incumbents are eligible to run for their current seats due to term limits, New Yorkers are electing many new office holders and the next roster of leadership for our city. There will be a new mayor of New York City elected here in 2021, as well as a new city controller, several new borough presidents, and many new city council members. And that's not all that's on the ballot. Several incumbents are eligible for and seeking re-election, including the city's public advocate. There's a very crowded and competitive race for Manhattan district attorney and more. In this episode, we're focused on the race for Manhattan borough president. So party primaries are set for June and the general election in will culminate in the fall on November 2nd. This is the first full set of municipal elections that will feature both early voting and the new ranked choice voting system. That system applies only to party primaries and special elections. And we'll discuss ranked choice voting in detail in a separate show. This city election cycle would of course be of enormous importance under more usual circumstances, but it's unfolding at a time of great crisis for our city, raising the stakes of the decisions that you the voter will make. The next wave of city leadership will quite clearly make or break the city's recovery from the devastation of the COVID-19 pandemic and its many impacts on health, families, jobs, housing, education, and much, much more. It's also important to note, of course, that the city faced a number of intense crises even before COVID, and some of those have only worsened. So it's an important time of choosing here in New York City, and we're pleased to bring you this series of interviews with candidates running for citywide and borough-wide offices, and there will be debates coming up, including for city council seats. But these one-on-one conversations will help you to get to know the candidates better, learn about their backgrounds, their platforms, where they stand on key issues, and what their vision is for the future of the city or the borough. We hope this and other interviews will help you sort through your many choices and make informed decisions when it's time to vote in the June primaries or November general election. So today we're focused on the position of Manhattan Borough President, a borough-wide office with several core responsibilities around land use, community boards, local funding, allocations, and more. But it's also a key role as a planner, an ombuds person, a cheerleader, and a representative of the borough. The borough president appoints community board members and convenes community board leaders while also acting as a convener in other ways, issuing reports, making other appointments, including to the community education councils, And the borough president has a bully pulpit, which can be mostly what the office holder makes of it, and an especially important voice on land use matters. So today's interview, joining me now by Zoom, is Ben Kalos, a Democratic candidate for Manhattan Borough President. Ben, thanks for joining me. Thank you, Ben, for having me. Thank you for the great work you do at Gotham Gazette. It is one of my favorite papers. For anyone who's focused on policy, and good government. It is the paper you want to read, and it's got a great roundup in the morning. Uh, Thank you. Appreciate that. Before we get into your campaign for Manhattan Borough President, a a little bit about your background, who you are, where you come from. uh, Give us the the kind of two-minute overview of of the Ben Kalos story. So I'm Ben Kalos. I'm co-chair of the New York City Council Progressive Caucus. Uh, I grew up right here And I can tell you that anywhere else in America, we hear stories about how you have to struggle to get out. But here in New York City, you have to struggle to stay. And together, I think we can fix that. And so I grew up right here. I lived with my single mom. We shared a bedroom. We lived with my grandparents. And I went to Bronx Science. And uh, I was pretty ashamed to have to stand in the uh, poor lunch line with the yellow tickets. So I didn't eat. And when I got elected to the city council, I fought for and won uh, universe free lunch. And as part of that, I've been pushing for ending youth hunger. So we've got free lunch. We're now serving free breakfast after the bell. And if we can give every single kid universal after school, we can get them dinner federally funded. And uh, that would just three squares of meals a day for 1.1 million public school students. That ends youth hunger. Uh, I'm a new parent, Ben, I know you're a new parent, uh, and childcare costs are just so out of control. 
And one thing we could do to help families raise, uh, raise their kids here is to make child care free. That starts with expanding universal pre-K to universal 3K. We don't have it in Manhattan, south of central Harlem, down to the tip. Uh, and we need to win that. And ultimately, uh, when we talk about the recovery and the fact that, listen, I've been a tenant all my life. I'm living in a uh, one bedroom uh, market rate with my wife, daughter. Uh, this is uh, my cat, Pandora. She says, hi. Uh, but I can tell you firsthand that it's been a struggle. And um, we've been lucky that we could shelter in place. Uh, but even with thousands of vacant apartments, we still have an affordable housing crisis. And I think that's because for far too long, uh, real estate developers get billions uh, in tax breaks and subsidies. Elected officials have been getting thousands of dollars in campaign contributions and uh, taxpayers, we pay for it all. That's why when I ran, I refused real estate money, corporate money, lobbyist money, uh, so that I could be independent and I've been able to win rezonings uh, for affordable housing. We uh, rezoned to, to stop uh, Billionaire's Row uh, in my district and are actually able to rezone residential neighborhoods to block residential buildings with empty voids in them. And I did that with our borough president, Gail Brewer. Uh, there's so much that the borough president can do and there's so much more to do. And I think that we can have a worker-led recovery and we can build a city for all of us. So if someone comes up to you uh, on the street, you, you represent parts of the east side of Manhattan and the city council as you, as you got out of it there. If someone comes up to you in the street and said, Ben, I, I, like, I like the work you've been doing as a city council member, you're running for borough president. Why is borough president important? What, what's, why does this position even matter? Uh, what is the borough president's you know, uh, impact on my life gonna be? Why should I even care about this election? What's your answer to that? I've been having that conversation over and over again. We do something that no other elected official in their right mind would do. The only other person who does it that I'm aware of is Leslie Nope, and that's in fiction on Parks and Rec. Uh, this morning, I did uh, my first Friday, I've been doing it every month for the past seven years, and we have conversations just like this. And I want a borough president that's open and accessible to everyone. Uh, and uh, what I would say to folks is, people have been coming to me and we've been solving a lot of problems in the council district. We didn't have pre-K seats. We won a thousand pre-K seats. Uh, we didn't have enough school seats. I wrote a new law to force the city to be more transparent about how they determine where we need them. And now we have funding for 800 new school seats. Uh, our parks were literally falling into the river. We've secured $874 million, nearly a billion dollars to rebuild a resilient waterfront from the east side to East Harlem. And we even cleaned up the neighborhood with a new trash can on every corner. And now that I'm seven years into my term, a lot of what I'm hearing from folks isn't really about the Upper East Side anymore. It's not about East Harlem. It's not about East Midtown or Roosevelt Island. It's about the rest of Manhattan. It's about our recovery. It's about what does our future look like? How can we clean up the rest of the city? How can we make sure we have enough school seats for everyone? How can we have equity in our parks? And how can we have the leadership that we need. And, and the answer is, as a borough president, I'll be able to do all the things I've been doing as a council member for my district and do it for the entire borough. And I can be our fixer. And so that means building more affordable housing. We've been opening homeless services in the neighborhood. We've opened uh, housing for homeless women and children across the street from where I live. On the Upper East Side, we're opening a new shelter two blocks from where I live on the Upper East Side. And we, we can do that everywhere we can open new parks, and we can clean up with a new trash can on every corner. And ultimately, the borough president is Manhattan's fixer. And there's been a lot that I've been able to win with borough president Gail Brewer in terms of rezoning to stop super talls. And I know that if they can get rid of me and they can get rid of Gail, they're going to try to get everything we've done undone. And so that, that's the price of liberty. It's eternal vigilance. And we're going to have to keep fighting and keep pushing that boulder up the hill. So you just got it where I wanted to go next, which was which was land use uh, decisions, land use advisory opinions. One of the most important roles of the borough president is to weigh in on significant land use matters. How would you approach that role? Do you think there's room for uh, a new way of thinking about development in Manhattan? Are you someone who wants to try to 
really limit the amount of new housing that goes up in the borough? How, how are you thinking about the land use powers and advisory capacity? And like I said in the intro, really the bully pulpit also of the borough president's office on land use. We've had an affordable housing crisis. It's actually defined in the law since the 1970s. It's been 50 years of elected officials promising affordable housing at the same time as they are giving real estate developers billions in tax breaks to offer affordable housing that we never seem to see. They're taking thousands in contributions and taxpayers are just paying for it all. That's one of the reasons I ran for city council. And it's one of the reasons that I've always refused real estate money, corporations, lobbyists, uh, because you can't be selling out your community. And um, I think that makes me very unique in this race. Uh, and just so folks who may not be as familiar, the planning process in our city has been profit driven. A developer comes to the council member who they may or may not have already given a lot of money, ask them for their support. It's a land use dance. The community board is forced into a position of uh, vote something up, vote something down, uh, kill the project or not. And there's no real planning. And so uh, what I've been able to do is I led the first of its kind community led rezoning to stop billionaires row from going into residential districts. And then we took the momentum from that rezoning to go after buildings where, where they would rather build buildings for billionaires with empty spaces in them by hundreds of feet to give billionaires better views than affordable housing. And so I was able to rezone Manhattan for that. And now I wanna go after the commercial districts. I wanna go after the financial districts. And I wanna have a people-based plan. I want our community boards to be leading it. And I think we can get more affordable housing as a chair in the, in the city council is able to oversee getting us about 6,000 units uh, with a mayoral administration that really failed to do anything in my district. I've done about 1,000 units of affordable housing uh, working with, uh, with uh, the, the governor's office and um, we can do more and I'd like to be able to do more. And one key piece is just folks should know this morning, 18,000 children woke up in a homeless shelter. 17,000 family members, 35,000 people. The majority of the people in our homeless shelter, about two thirds are families. They didn't do any, children never did anything wrong. They don't have drug problems. There's, it's not a mental, it's, it's a symptom of the affordable housing crisis. And so what I've said is right now, there are thousands of vacant apartments and the prices aren't going down. But what we could do as a city is if we went out there and just bought the 10,000 vacant apartments or even rented 10,000 vacant apartments, we could end homelessness for families. And I can tell you as a person who lives in a building that has group housing in it, that I would welcome them as my neighbors. And whether it's having uh, homeless women and children living across the street from me, a homeless shelter two blocks away or next door, uh, that's a city I want to wake up in. Let, let, let's get a little more specific. Um, where in Manhattan do you think there's really uh, good room for growth for affordable housing? Everywhere and anywhere. Before, mandate, before Mayor de Blasio proposed mandatory inclusionary housing, uh, I had put forward a proposal for the Upper East Side, which is where I represent, it's where I know the most. And what I said is, listen, we're doing the Second Avenue subway. Right now, if I opened my window behind me, you'd see a lot of six-story brownstones along the avenues. And all of those are zoned to go up with unlimited height. Unlimited height, we are starting to see buildings that are 400, 500, 600 feet tall. And it's not because that's how tall they need to be. It's because um, you can charge more when you have 16 foot floor to ceiling windows. It's really bad for the environment, but you can make a ton. And so what I've proposed, and I have the support from community board aid and friends of the Upper East Side Historic Districts and even groups like Civitas and others is just to say, if you're gonna build over a certain height, you have to include affordable housing on site. And so, I would do it on the Upper East Side. I would do it anywhere in Manhattan. And I would make sure that we had certainty because right now we don't know how tall the buildings are gonna be. And we would say, if you wanna build as of right market rate luxury housing, which they've been building nonstop in my district, thousands and thousands of units more so than almost anywhere else, uh, then you can build up to 210, it's fine. But if you wanna go over 210 feet, if you wanna to go to 260, which is what we were able to actually negotiate as part of mandatory inclusionary housing, then you have to include affordable housing on site. And one thing I'll say, it was really disappointing 
is we tried to do this for all of Manhattan to require additional affordable housing to build tall. And Gail Brewer and I, we lost. We got 96th Street South, but the elected officials north of 96th Street wanted to give height away to developers without requiring affordability. As borough president, I want to fix that. Are you in favor, broadly speaking, of the plans for a, a rezoning and upzoning for housing in um, the Soho NoHo area? I think what we're seeing from the de Blasio administration is a very profit-driven plan. They're going from a neighborhood which had zero residential and a lot of manufacturing, a lot of lofts that were converted illegally and are now places that people can live and where artists can live, to a plan to go from zero to the maximum allowable under law, uh, which is 12 FAR, which is what we get on the Upper East Side. For context, a 12 FAR building could be 20 stories if the person's being a, a reasonable developer or could be 600 or 700 feet if they want to be a jerk about it. And so what the community's put forward is saying, let's go from zero residential to five residential and let's have a mandatory inclusionary housing requirement as part of that. I think that's a really great place to start. And the city's plan, as far as I don't understand, doesn't actually speak to the heritage of the artist community there and doesn't do anything about preservation of the character of the neighborhood. And so I'd like to make sure that whatever we're planning actually preserves this as an art center for anyone and everyone. And uh, no, no one race has the corner on arts. And we need to make sure that uh, artists from every culture, every part of the world, uh, black and brown and what have you, can all have a home in Soho and be artists there. So um, <clears throat> I think, even the community agrees, everyone agrees that we need to do more at Soho. It's just a question of how do we do it right without giving away the sky, without getting anything in back. And just one piece, which is very timely, the Department of City Planning recently put out a report talking about how certain neighborhoods weren't actually getting, netting out more housing. Right. And so one example I can give you in my district is we had four brownstones, 20 units each, and they were rent regulated. Some of them were rent controlled. So people were paying a couple hundred a month some were paying less than 2000 a month, but mainly it was around the $1,500, $1,200 mark for an apartment it was in a walk-up. We lost those four buildings, and what we got back was 100 units. None of them were affordable, all market rate. We lost 80 units of affordable housing, got nothing in return. We got 100 market rates, and so we only added 20 units of housing at market rate. What, what's so the, one what's of the problems that people aren't talking about, which is going to be an issue at Soho and anywhere else, is that we have to say that if we're doing affordable housing, we have to have a net number. It can't just be, oh, we tore stuff down and now the affordable housing we built is more expensive, but it's nicer. We have to say, okay, if we're tearing down 80 units, we have to build 80 units of affordable housing before we get credit for building anything new. Let's maybe come back to, to some land use matters in a little bit, but this is ties in, which is community boards. Uh, you have, as borough president, a lot of say in who sits on community boards. Is there a way that you would do that process differently? Are there ways that you would try to make sure that community boards are more representative of their districts and their neighborhoods and their communities? How would you approach that part of the job? I came up through community board eight. I served on community board eight. And um, I think what I've been able to prove as a council member is that when a community board, a council member and a borough president work together, uh, we win. Uh, I've been allocating funds to the community boards that I represent uh, for urban planners. Having technical expertise on the urban, on the community boards can make, give them equal footing with well-resourced developers. It's one of the reasons that I introduced legislation to do so. Along the same lines, uh, as you mentioned, a lot of our community boards are not reflective of the communities that they represent. And so uh, on my community board eight, um, we've been uh, putting an objective criteria. Does the person still show up? Are they still involved? And so we've had a really high turnover on community board eight where I have the most appointments. I authored a resolution with Gail Brewer to put teens on community boards and uh, We've been working to put people from labor organizations, uh, people who are disabled, public housing residents. And so now we have a community board that has gone from incredibly pro-development, anti-worker, uh, anti-transportation to a community board that's focused on building affordable housing. Uh, where other communities are rejecting homeless services, 
Community Board 8 passed a resolution unanimously in support of a homeless shelter two blocks from where I live. And that took seven years of work to do. Um, we have a community board that is fighting for good jobs that is much more reflective and representative of the community uh, with a diversity of voices. And last but not least, as a council member, I was working on legislation for both those urban planners and term limits. Uh, it's something that Gotham Gazette, I think, did most of the coverage on. Uh, we brought it to the voters and we won term limits for the community board starting in 2029. And as the next borough president, I'll be the one getting, thing, getting folks ready for training and making sure folks can have the strongest possible community boards. I had to beat the real estate board of New York to get those term limits, but we did. And a lot of folks are concerned about institutional knowledge. My daughter's three. By the time term limits hit community boards, she will be in middle school. So I think that if my daughter can get to middle school in that time, we can get our community boards ready to be an even stronger force to fight for planning in their neighborhoods. Do you think there's a need in Manhattan to um, do a lot more to increase the ability for buses to get around quickly? And if so, what would you try to do? Yes, I, um, I don't own a car. Uh, that makes me very unlike most of the people who are running for office, including in this race. Uh, and it makes me more like 80% of New Yorkers who rely on public transportation. Uh, I worked very close to Congressman Miller Maloney uh, as we got the Second Avenue subway, which literally took 100 years to open, opened. Uh, we've actually added ferry service. And yes, I take the bus. I love the bus. Uh, it's me and the seniors. We love the buses. And so we were able to win two select bus routes, um, the M79 and the M86 in my district. Uh, and uh, as I've said to folks in the New York Times shared, uh, it's a virtuous circle. People get to work faster, they make more money, we get more tax revenue. When people complained about buses not working in my district, them never showing up, we would report it to MTA. There was this game of he said, she said. Now listen, I'm a software developer. And the one thing I do know is that with bus time, I know when the next bus is coming, but I can take, I can use a computer to identify where every single bus is at every single moment in New York City. Closest thing I'll ever get to omniscience. And so we use that to identify that buses were missing from the east side. And we were able to win 300 new buses. And so I wanna use data and evidence to force MTA to improve service, improve bus service, and add new buses and fix routes and bottlenecks so that we can get people where they're going faster. And I've done it before and I'll do it again for the entire borough of Manhattan. Do you like the busway model for certain um, certain avenues, certain streets? The bus lanes are absolutely amazing and we've been expanding them in my district. Uh, I don't have the busway. They do have that on 14th Street and we're hearing lots of great news about it. I've actually been working with our current borough president, Gail Brewer, to identify locations where we could actually add the busways. We have the transverses through Central Park up here. So we've been looking at, are there other parts where we can do it or how do we do a best way while still working with a uh, crosstown transfers? So um, I'm looking for places to do it. All right, we're in our last five minutes here. So I'm gonna try to throw a few things at you in a little bit of quicker fashion, okay? So uh, number one, name one community, one area of Manhattan that has a particular need and what it is and what you would try to do to address it. East Harlem, which I represent eight blocks of, I represent the hell of it, it uh, has brought up sanitation issues. I went through the budget with their budget committee and discovered that they receive three times less funding than the Upper East Side for waste pickup. Uh, we're currently working together to add trash cans and waste services and bring equity to sanitation here in Manhattan. Continue the Close Rikers uh, build for New Borough based jails plan, scrap it, or altered in some way? Uh, we have a moral imperative to close Rikers. Anyone who says different needs to go visit and see it for themselves. When I visited, I saw human beings in crisis and they were only being hurt more uh, by what was going on. And I was an elected official, they were on their best behavior. Uh, you can't close Rikers without a place to be there. Uh, we, I, I would like to get to a decarcerate world, but we do need an intermediary step. I voted in favor of the borough-based jails. 
And uh, we need to move forward with that plan. We can't just let them keep Rikers open. And that's a responsible thing to do as borough president. I would be a borough president who would be working to implement that plan, listening to the communities here in Manhattan, working with the Chinatown organizations. I'd wanna make sure that we actually built something that was responsive to what the community is looking for. Do you believe in um, developing housing on underutilized NYCHA land, uh, sometimes referred to as infill development? Do you think uh, plans along those lines to develop new housing on NYCHA land should be moved ahead aggressively, totally not, uh, totally scrapped or somewhere in between? We need to build more affordable housing. When they announced NYCHA infill, I came out in support of it and I said that we needed to do it. It should be 100% affordable housing. We should give residents in the existing buildings 100% preference and we should have the buy-in from the residents. And when they proposed it in my district, they proposed 30% affordable. They wanted to build 70% luxury, 50 stories tall with no preference for the public housing residents who live there. And for those, and they wouldn't even give us enough money to fund repairs in the existing buildings. And the city was gonna get, uh, it was uh, valued at $60 million and the city was only getting $30 million. And for those reasons, I opposed it. I worked with Gail Brewer who brought a lawsuit. We beat the infill. And I want any of these things to go through Euler. And I want the council member and I as borough president to make sure that they have to listen and work with the residents. Um, we need to build affordable housing and there are NYCHA developments where the residents have come forward, senior groups have come forward, uh, faith-based groups have come forward to say, let's build more uh, senior housing and we can do it and it should be 100% affordable. We're in our last two minutes here. Final final question before uh, before one very short one at the end. You have always been, you know, had a focus on sort of how government works and doesn't work. In just one minute, right now, as we go into this election cycle and a new city government taking over next year. What's one thing you point to that's really broken in city government that needs to be fixed and that you would pledge to continue to work on or start working on as borough president? It's, it's the money in politics. And so I wrote the new campaign finance system. We reduced the amounts of money real estate developers or anyone could give down from $5,000 to $2,000. We're matching contributions of $250 eight times so that it's whether you got $2,000 or $250, that becomes $2,000. It's the same. Is there a next, is there a next step in that, that well, you're doing? I, what, what I would say there is just, it's not a next step. It's just, um, it's the right thing to do. More, like, more candidates are running the right way like I am by refusing real estate money, corporate money, and lobbyist money. And we have a chance to elect a whole new city council, borough president, even mayoral candidates who haven't been corrupted by this money. And if we lose, this system's gone. Um, and so I think for me, it's a lot about getting the things we've done, done and keeping the momentum moving forward in the right direction. All right, we, we do have to leave it there. City Council member Ben Kalos is a Democrat running for Manhattan Borough President. Thank you for the time. Thank you for having me and thank you for all the readers and listeners and watchers. And thank you for watching Decision NYC with Ben Max. Key decisions for New York City voters are coming up in the June primaries and the November general election. There's a lot on the line for all of us and the future of the city. I hope this conversation and others are helpful to you as you make your choices when it comes time to vote. I'm Ben Max. See you next time.